Hello everyone, welcome to Whack, uh, fucking Whack Comics. I'm here with Tyler Crook, the writer and artist on The Lonesome Hunters. He's also the artist on Harrow County, Unbelievable Unteens, uh, BPRD. You've done so much, Tyler. I really appreciate you being here with me today. Hey, thanks so much for asking me. It's it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's going to be great, man. I, I um, <clears throat> had the, the privilege of reading the, the Lonesome Hunters, thanks to you. And um, I honestly can't believe this is your first time writing a, a comic all by yourself, right? Um, yeah, this is the first time writing something of this scope, for sure. Yeah. Like I did, yeah. um, for Harrow County, we did uh, backup stories in the back of each individual issue. Yeah. And they were just one-page stories, but I wrote about half of those. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Nice, yeah. nice. Um, so, uh, my, my first question is, um, the Lonesome Hunters and the Two Wolf Child is your, your first time writing a, a full comic book. How was that experience for you writing and drawing your own comic book? Um, it's a lot harder than I anticipated, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm not like, not in a way where it felt like I wouldn't be able to do it, but in uh, just the amount of sort of uh, energy and sort of um, like my, the emotional toll of working on a book all by yourself is a lot, a lot harder. You know, there's so much stuff that I do. Like whenever I do, like for Harrow County, I do interviews with, with Cullen Bunn, the writer and, um, you know, and the interviewer would ask a question and I would just sort of look at Cullen and be like, you do this one, buddy. You know what I mean? And when you're the only one on, on deck, there's like no, there's no passing anything off. So it's, it definitely feels like a lot more weight on my shoulders to sort of keep the book going. But, um, but overall though, I would say that it's been very fulfilling. Like I think that um, the Lonesome Hunters is probably the best book I've ever, I've ever worked on. And I'm just, I'm super, super proud of it. And um, yeah, when I read back through it, I sort of am, uh, have one of those one of those moments where I'm like, you know, it's so far back already. Like the first story arc is over a year ago, almost two years ago that I wrote that. So when I look at it now, I'm still sort of like, um, I'm removed enough from it that I am surprised that that I did that. You know, it's so great, it's like it. yeah, <clears throat> it's it's good. I think everyone should. Uh, I think every comic book artist should try writing at least once. I'm definitely like um i've read a lot of comics obviously and there's i've read it a couple of times you know where an artist has tried uh to do the writing as well and uh i'll say like half the time it works out pretty good and uh you mm -hmm. blew my expectations out of the water like i've i felt like you've been writing uh comics for a, a lot longer than you have from reading this you know it felt like an experienced writer it was uh it was amazing yeah, that's really good to hear. Because you know, you know, having it be my first uh, series like this, it does feel like, um, like I feel very uh, unsure of myself a lot more. I, like I'm very confident in like my artistic chops, but when it comes to my writing chops, I um, really am am uh, just concerned about being good. I guess I I hope that. Hold on one second. Sorry, my um my brush water was uncovered and my cat was going for a little sip and <laughs> <laughs> try, try to avoid that. Um, Fair enough. So I don't know. I hope that I was, a, I like I, my nervousness sort of manifested as me just being like very um, conscientious about my writing and trying really hard to sort of separate myself from it to think about like, is this actually working the way I want it to work or am I just fooling myself? Because, you know, nobody sets out to write a, a, a bad comic book. So um, you can think that you're on top of the world. And I'm like, oh, I know a lot of a lot of people who have written bad comics who must have felt exactly like this when they were <laughs> writing their terrible comic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you did amazing, Tyler. You should be proud of yourself. Right. And I really uh, hope that everyone goes and uh, picks this up and gives it a try. I don't think anyone will be disappointed um, given it, given it a shot. Um, my, my second question for you is, uh, why did you have to pick magpies as the antagonist? I'm already very afraid of magpies living in Australia <laughs> here. Uh, we have, uh, in spring, we call it magpie season. They just come, come for you as, as you're walking past and sweep mm -hmm. you. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, 
I think you've turned my fear of magpies from like 10 to 100. <laughs> well, I think that the magpies in North America and in Europe are probably different than the ones in Australia. When I was doing a lot of, you know, looking for reference, I got a lot of photos of people being attacked by magpies in Australia. And they seem like real assholes over there. It happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's like all the Australian animals, you know, everything's poisonous or will attack you. Yeah. But uh, I, I can't remember exactly where, like why I wanted it to be magpies. I think it had to do with um, the nursery rhyme that Howard says um, in the first issue, the where he tries to cast a ward on them. I have to pull it up because I can't remember exactly what he said, what it is. But he's saying the, um, uh, one for sorrow, two for mirth, three for funeral, four for birth. It's like, that's some sort of a, a, a rhyme that was sort of come up with to ward off magpies at some point. So that, I think that was where, um, I was originally got the inspiration to go with magpies and you know, where I live in the Pacific Northwest, there aren't a lot of magpies and um, I've always just thought they're kind of interesting, interesting birds. All those, um, are they corvids? The crow related birds are all really fascinating. It's a really smart. It was a, it was a great choice. I feel like I've, it's very original. I've never seen or read a book. Uh, with uh, magpies as the antagonist, and I thought it was very, very well <laughs> done. And uh, I, there was there was so many reviews that I read where um, they always referred to them as crows and ravens, and I'm like, we were very clear this whole time that they were magpies. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why you're you just want them to be crows and ravens, but maybe because they're the default spooky bird. No, yeah, they are. The magpies are the scary bird for him for uh, me here in Australia, <laughs> and. Uh, You've definitely, like I said, up up the ante on my fear of birds. So thanks for that. Hey, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me know which other animal you want to be scared of, and I'll I'll get on it. <laughs> what can you tell us about the mysterious guy that's looking uh, for the soul, and and how do, how do you think the uh, the magpie queen is going to help him? Um, I don't want to say too much about him, as it's as like that's we're going to get into that in the story eventually um but uh and he is he's the the sword's proper owner um i think we established that pretty clearly yeah, um, yeah. and uh yeah i don't know what i really want to say about him other than that he is um he's a very powerful guy and he's very very old i mean he's old enough that uh, he'll just lay down and take a nap for whoever knows, you know, who knows how long he was just sort of napping in the, in the forest there with all the twigs and leaves covering him. Um, yeah. He's a character that um, sort of came to me late in the development of the storyline. And um, he sort of ties into some very ancient uh, uh, writings and stuff that, that exist in real life that um, I took ins inspiration from. But like I said, we'll get, we'll get into that eventually in the, in the story. There's a, I think he's a cool guy. Yeah, he is very cool. I think you've done a, a great job of setting up a mystery with him as well. You know, we've been drip fed little parts of him uh, walking along, you know, and, and at the mm -hmm. little bit of spoilers at the end of the second volume, you know, we see him, uh, the, the magpie queen meeting up with him as well. And it's just like, uh, I just can't, can't wait to know what's happening with this guy. You know, um, nice. Then I'm doing yeah. my job because I'm excited to tell, talk about him. But um, in the story, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking definitely looking forward to that. Um, what if anything do you feel like you've learned from uh, some amazing writers that you've worked with, like Colin Bunn and Jeff Lemire, on on your uh, writing process, and how did you uh, implement any of those things that you might have learned? I definitely learned. Um, both of them sort of write, like they, they they approach topics very differently, I think, as far as like um, how they approach the emotional core of a story and, or of a character or whatever. Um, but both of them have a very um, 
distinct like or like an almost similar w way of pacing a page particularly and like the amount of dialogue that they'll put on a single page is is usually um a lot less than what um what sort of i would have done if i hadn't ever worked with them you know what i mean like seeing how efficient they are with their dialogue really pushed me to be um as like just tight and snappy as i could be with my dialogue and try to you know make every line count for you know 10 lines um, yeah. so like that sort of stuff i definitely learned from them um yeah like they're both really really good at um they're just really good writers for working with an artist like they're really good at sort of giving an artist enough information that um that you know i could go off and tell the story and not have to do a lot of like what does this mean what are you talking about or like you know or can i move the camera around to a different way you know it's like it's always just enough info that i can um I know what's important, but then I can add on my own, you know, stylistic choices or my own, you know, tweaks to the pacing and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, like, I don't think I would be able, I don't think I would be able to have written the Lonesome Hunters at all if I hadn't worked with those guys and John Arcudi to boot, like he's, uh, he wrote all the BPRD stuff that I worked on. And, um, and I mean, between the three of those guys, like arcudi has been writing comics since the nineties and, um, and Lemire and Lemire and Colin Bunn, I think both actually started, I guess Lemire started a little bit before us, but me and me and Colin started about the same time, but Colin also like writes so much stuff. Like he's just, a, he's like got a lot more miles under him than I have as far as like I'm not a lot more pages under his belt than I do. So he's like definitely got a got a lot of knowledge to to swipe from. So yeah, I don't know if that's specific enough for your for your question, but yeah, just just hanging like just working with those guys, you learn a lot. Yeah. Definitely. Well, it feels like less is more is like the main thing you would have learned uh, by the sounds of your answer. Yeah, to, to like sort of dig down and find like what the important thing is to to express and try to express it in a way that feels natural and um, and hopefully like without adding complexity um, tries to search for the depth of a thing, you know, without adding noise, just sort of take it take the idea of a scene and dig as deep as you can as quickly as you can without you know drilling holes in other directions if that metaphor is <laughs> making any sense at all uh i can't imagine it would have been a, a great help um to work with such great writers you know before writing yeah. your own uh piece yeah i don't think uh, too many people would have been in that position that you were in to to be able to do that um to do it that way and uh yeah that, that's very cool that you were, were able to yeah yeah, no, I've been very, very fortunate in the um, collaborators that I've been able to work with. I mean, um, I did mostly, it's like Arcudi and Bun and Lemire and those three guys um, I've done so many books with. <laughs> well, I guess like Lemire, I've done two. Arcudi, I've done like four or five. Cullen, I've done like, I don't know, I've probably done over a thousand pages with Cullen. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I've just, it's been, like I'm really fortunate to have worked with those guys because they're all just really top of their game. So. Uh, can you please run us through your process of writing and drawing uh, the Lonesome Hunters? Um, it's very much like in flex, kind of, or in like it's it's sort of always changing. I have a when it comes to writing, um, I am uh, new enough to to it that I really sort of. Like I don't have a, a a set process that I can really settle on. Um, I do a lot of like I'll have a process that I sort of work my way through until I get stuck, and then I try something else, a different process, a different way of trying to, to approach it. And it's really a scattershot thing. Um, I will say that I do generally work from more general to more specific. So I do a lot of outlining 
and most of my like drafts are um, outline drafts where I'm like going through and just writing out the events of each page over and over and over and um, and just reworking those and reworking those until I get something um, that I feel good about. And then I go through and um, usually I will sort of thumbnail a scene, um, you know, do a, a rough layout of a page and write dialogue at the same time. Something that actually has been helping me a lot lately has just been being able to dictate to my um, my iPad. So I'll like be drawing a scene really, really fast and loose. Like literally it'll take me like 30 seconds to lay out a page in, at this stage. And then I'll go through and hit record on my, you know, Microsoft Word on my iPad and just like say all the dialogue that I want. And then I'll go through and edit that. and. Uh, and then I'll sort of change up my layouts and change up my dialogue a little bit and stuff. Um, yeah, like it's it's really it's a mess. My my writing process is a is a real mess. But for me, like the big thing with it is that um, when I get stuck, I have to really not um, not take a break from it and just come at it from a different perspective as fast as I can. Because as soon as I sort of like set something aside to, you know, with the intention of like thinking about it and coming back to it later. Um, I never think about it. You know, I can always come back to it and I'm in the exact same spot. So it's like, I always have to, I have to try to, you know, just like I said, come at it from a different angle and, and try to, um, try to just beat my head against the wall from a slightly different, different direction and hope I can break through. Um, Yes, and that's my writing process. My art process is um, pretty set up by now. I have a, it's pretty solid. Like I, I have lots of times, um, if I'm writing, I'll usually do my layouts on paper and then I'll scan those in and do my lettering on top of that. Uh, and then once I have my lettering done, or at least like a rough pass of the lettering, then I'll go through and I'll pencil the whole book and I work digitally on my pencils. And then uh, I print those out onto my nice art paper. And I ink and paint on that. Then I scan it back in, put the lettering on digitally and like tweak it a little bit and then send it off and it's done. Uh, and so that, sounds, that sounds like the easy part, but like, like writing an issue of Lonesome Hunters took me about a week, you know, five, five or six days. And then um, drawing and painting it is um, about a full month after that. It's about 30, 35 days or something like that. And those yeah. are like work, those are like work days, not, not counting weekends. Your pages uh, are amazing. Just so beautifully painted and stuff like that. I'm surprised to hear that you um, do your pencils digitally. What do you think, uh, and makes that process easier for you on penciling digitally. Um, it's just the the flexibility of it. Being able to make changes is so much faster than mm -hmm. um, when I'm penciling on paper. Because you know you'll be like you'll pencil something on paper, and you'll have a hand in slightly the wrong position, and to on paper you have to erase it and redraw the hand from scratch. But um, you know digitally you can just grab it and move the hand over, and it's it's basically that just being able to adjust the composition of a panel and of a page, you know, just to make small tweaks without having to redraw everything from scratch is, is the big motivator. And if I could, I would, I would pencil on paper, but it's just the, the benefit. I think it benefits the work to be able to work digitally because um, like when I work on pencil, it's much more enjoyable process for me, but I don't, um, but it's like, when you have to make a correction, it's like you have to weigh that time versus the value of the correction thing. And when it's digital, you don't have to weigh that. You can just like make the best choices through, you know, hopefully make the best choices anyway through the whole process. So That's great. yeah, it's just flexibility. Sounds like you got the, the best of both, both worlds uh, doing pencil and digitally and then uh, inking and painting traditionally. I think, I think so. Maybe like I, I definitely don't think I could 
do a whole book. Well, I couldn't do a, a color book digitally. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I would sort of um, really struggle with that. I did do sort of during the, like the height of the pandemic, I was doing a, a comic book on Instagram that was, I was just doing a panel per day. And one of my uh, goals with doing that was to just get better at using Clip Studio Paint, which is the program I use for penciling in. And um, I was doing finished pages in that, but they were just two colors, like black and white with a sort of a brown um, tone. And those um, those were all digital. And uh, so I think I could do that. I just, I just don't want to. It's not as fun to me, you know. I'm actually, I'm still working on that story, um, but I'm planning on moving the whole thing. Uh, well, at least all of the inking digitally, so eventually. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, what can you uh, tease for us for what's to come next with the Lonesome Hunters? And have you got a, a title maybe you could tease for the next book as well, if you've got one in um, mind? I don't have a title yet. I always like, titles are always the hardest part for me. And it takes like 50 emails with any editor I'm working with to find a title. But um, I would say that like the next, we're going to learn a lot more about um, the church that Howard um, went to next. And uh, we're going to, um, and you know, in, in general, I think things are going to get a lot worse before things get a lot better for, for poor Howard and Lupe. And they've sort of, um, they set off on this path that um, has like a good goal at the end, but um, but they're not the best suited for, <laughs> for this task. And um, you know, that they're gonna really struggle to get, you know, to get to the end. Um, do you have a, a sort of long plan set out for the Lonesome Hunters? Do you, do you think we'll get a cup, good couple more volumes or? Yeah, you know, I'm really hoping for, you know, and it always just depends on if enough people buy the book to keep it going. But um, I have, I have plans for, um, you know, depending on how things go between like another two story arcs or another um, four story arcs. But yeah, I do have, definitely have like, they're definitely going someplace. Um, like I, I have the definite, the, the destination in mind and, you know, we're trying to get there. I've, uh, I've got my fingers crossed for four story arcs because uh, I'm loving this world and I would love to, <laughs> to hang around in it for a lot longer. Nice. Yeah. I, I hope so too. Sorry about my dog. We're, um, we're at the time of day where a few people are walking by out front and she hates that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you've worked on, a, like you said, a fair few series with Cullen Bunn before. I think Harrow County is the longest one that you've done uh, with him, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How was it working with him on uh, such a, a long book like that? Um, so working with Cullen was really great. I think he and I are so sort of simpatico in like the kinds of horror that we that we like, um, especially like what we wanted to do with Harrow County was like there's that you know, our friend and collaborator uh Brian Hurt uh described Harrow County as like the world's sweetest horror story, which I think um, is exactly what, what we wanted to do. You know, we wanted to do something that's like scary and creepy and dark, but have just that, um, you know, have that core uh, bit of humanity at the, at the root of the story. And, um, and so he, he and I both wanted that re really, you know, from the start. And so, um, yeah, I mean, if, if I could describe working with Colin as anything, I would say that it's definitely, um, uh, sort of effortless, you know, he, he writes really good scripts and he gives you room to do what you want to do with them. And, um, we really took, like, I, I learned, um, a sort of my collaboration, uh, philosophy sort of came out of working with Cullen and it's um, it's sort of like if you ever heard anyone talk about doing like uh, improv comedy stuff, they have that yes and rule. And um, I try really hard to implement that when I'm working with, with someone, um, especially someone as talented as Cullen is like you, he gives you something and just like, you never, never shoot it down. You always just go yes. And, and then I add my, 
my bit on top of it, you know, and try to take it just that much further. Um, Cause he likes to set up, you know, set up his artists with stuff that's like very fun and meaty. And it's got like a lot of character, like a lot of great monsters and a great, a lot of great scenarios. I mean, the whole thing in Harrow County, there's a character, um, the skinless boy who is like, a skinless boy, but then his skin is um, sort of in the possession of the main character, Emmy. And she, um, so she can send the skinless boy off to do little tasks for her, but then she can talk to him through his skin that she like keeps in her backpack. And um, like that stuff is just incredible. Like, <laughs> And when he first, when Cullen first pitched that to me, I was, I really sort of hummed and hawed because I was like, I don't know if drawing like a flayed skin dude is like going to actually be cool like it seems really kind of silly to me um but then once i sort of decided that no i needed to yes and this it's like then then i really started to really love it and there's there's one scene in harrow county that i'm really proud of where i got to add um a little bit of acting where it's like emmy is doing laundry and you know hanging up the laundry to dry and she's hung up the skinless boy's skin and then the skinless boy comes in you know, and is talking to her and stuff and just reaches up and holds his own hand as it's hanging from the, the clothesline. And I'm like, this is such a great character that I could be able to do something like that. And Colin's just really good at like, yeah, giving you stuff like that. Yeah. I absolutely love the skinless boy. I think he's one of my favorite characters uh, throughout Harrow County as well. I'm, I'm glad that you, yeah. you pushed through and uh, kept going with that. Cause I like the element of, the the boy you know and, and then his skin like you said it's it, it's almost like two characters in one you know it's uh, yeah it's perfect and it also has like i used to i called it um haint tech where it's like the the ghosty tech stuff that you could do you know like instead of having a fancy you know watch radio or tv watch or whatever you have the skinless boy how did it feel working on uh bprd and what was it like adding to the hellboy mythos Oh man, I don't, well, I don't know how much I really added to the mythos. I feel like I was, <laughs> when I was working on BPRD, I felt like I was barely treading water, to be honest. Like I was sort of just barely hanging in there. But um, BPRD, like before I started working in comics full time, if you had asked me like what, what comic book, like existing you know, comic book universe, would you like to work in? I would have said like the Mignola verse and, and work on BPRD would have been my, my dream job. And then um, that was like my first job. You know what I mean? It was just like, I don't know. I really, I, to this day, I still am sort of like um, just shocked that, that I was given that opportunity and I was so lucky and um, I was so ill prepared for it. Um, and uh, everyone I worked with was like, was really patient with me, I think, in that whole that whole era of of working on those. But you know, I learned so so much. Like that was um, that was like going to graduate school for comics or whatever. Like I, my very first book was um, a two hundred and fifty page graphic novel about the assassination of Rasputin, and that was um, you know a two and a half year. Um, you know, learning experience where like when I got done with that, I was sort of like, I think I know how to draw comics now, you know? And then um, working on BPRD was sort of a lot of like, like, you know how to draw comics, Tyler, but you don't really know how to draw them well yet, you know, sort of learning experience. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was great in a lot of ways. Um, um, in a lot of ways, it was it was hard in ways that it didn't need to be. I mean, um, the editor at the time, Scott Alley, um, I was all, I was really surprised when I stopped working with him. How I felt like my work got sort of instantly better. Um, and I, I've worked with um, Daniel Shaban for so long now. Like he's the editor on Lonesome Hunters, and he was the editor on all of the black hammer stuff I did. And he's the editor on Harrow County. And uh, he was the assistant editor on BPRD. Um, but as soon as it was sort of like working directly with, with Daniel, my work got way, way better. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, working on BPRD was was a, overall, I think, a really good experience. But it, it had it definitely had its ups and downs, and um, was uh, just like a huge learning experience for me. Doesn't sound like uh, there's a better way to to learn than to you know be on BPRD and in the help yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, That's amazing. Well, I I think there would be less stressful ways to learn for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jeff Lemire is one of my favorite creators, probably my favorite creator mm -hmm. of all time. I absolutely love everything he does, but uh, Black Hammer in particular might be one of my favorite things. It's just so big, uh, everything in it. You've worked on uh, two titles now with Colonel Weird and mm -hmm. uh, Unbelievable Untings. Uh, what was it like to work with Jeff and add to the world of Black Hammer? Um. You know, in a lot of ways, it was a lot like working with Cullen. It's like uh, Jeff is just really good at sort of giving an artist what they need and sort of getting out of the way and and letting us do our thing. Um, and in that way, he's like re very generous in that way. Um, but also, I think he he knows that that's sort of the best way to get a good comic book, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, working with with Jeff was was another one of those really like effortless ex experiences. Like, I didn't feel like um, there was like there was never any like <laughs> you know, there's never no heated conversations of me being like, "Let me hear you," you know, none of that. So it was like <laughs> it was it was a really really fun experience, you know. And like, um, I I had never done. Uh, superhero stuff and like my my desire to work on superhero books is um you know not as great as a lot of other comic book artists and um i think the black hammer stuff was like a, just a perfect fit where if i was going to do superhero stuff working in the black hammer universe is um probably the best fit that i could have could have hoped for um so yeah i mean jeff's scripts are really tight and they're like just really they're just really fun i mean he's got so much stuff in there that like and the difference between uh writing and and drawing a comic is like really you're both sort of writing the story together um but the the writer the person in the writing role um has to come up with stuff out of like literally nothing you know and as an artist at least you get that script with with all of these like really um fun like prompts for ways to get like you know get the story going um so yeah and jeff's is really just really good at that and there's so much stuff in black hammer that is just so rich and fun and and silly and sad and like you know there's just so much depth to all that stuff that yeah working on working on those books was really really fun I really loved um, Unbelievable Untings, uh, probably a little bit more out of anything in the, uh, out of all the spinoffs. I thought it was such a great oh. story. Um, and especially the, the comic within the comic book, you know, we get to mm -hmm. see two different art styles from you. Just wondering, how did you approach uh, that, getting two different art styles in the book? Um, I didn't really switch up my art style per se, I just sort of switched up the, the sort of technique I was using, I guess. So, um, so when things are happening in real life, um, they're all painted in watercolor, like my usual work. Uh, but then when we go into, and we see the comic book version of, of events, um, I basically colored that, I inked that um, on paper and then scanned it in and I, and I colored it. And the colors I used were, um, like I went through uh, an old, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like a coloring guide from the eighties, but mm -hmm. I have a couple places where I have printed versions of those and I scanned those in and I got the colors out of it and um, sort of recreated them. And it was actually kind of a huge, um, a huge process to get those pages done. I mean, cause there's pages, there's some double page spreads that are partially watercolor partially line art and um 
and digital color and like getting all those pieces to sort of match up and hook together and, and actually, you know, send them out to the printer in a way that worked, um, was pretty challenging sometimes, but, um, but that was actually a really fun, a really fun challenge to try to get that going. I think it uh, really paid off too. So it made the book a lot of fun, you know, um, and seeing the two different uh, sort of styles together or two different techniques rather is uh, was really cool to see, especially like you said, even on the same like double spread uh, page spread at times, it was, it was great. Nice. I'm glad it worked. It was like, um, I was like uh, very worried about it too. When I first was like, this is how I'm going to approach it guys. Because I didn't, um, it's so, it was so time consuming that I didn't do a lot of like, um, you know, pre-production testing of the, of my work process. I had to sort of just picture it in my head, how all the different layers were going to work together and, you know, pray that it worked. And I, I think it worked. It did for sure. Yeah. Uh, would you be keen to work back in the, the Black Hammer universe again? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I'd love to work with um, Lemire again. The guy's a the stand-up guy. Awesome. Uh, so before you were in comic books, you were in video games. Mm -hmm. uh, how and why did you transition from video games to comic books? Um, mostly burnout from video games. Um, I, you know, I always wanted to be, I always wanted to draw, draw comic books. Like that was the job that I've wanted since I was just a little kid. And um, I actually sort of never thought that I would achieve that goal. You know, I really thought that um, it was something that was just beyond me. Um, like I, for some reason, I could just never really figure out um, how to get into comics. And then um, like what I would do is when I was working in video games, I would sort of like get really sick of my job and be like, you know what? Forget this. I'm going to go. I'm going to work on a comic book portfolio and I'm going to get into comics. And, you know, I would go home for nights and weekends and work on that a little bit. And then, um, you know, a couple weeks later, things at work would sort of cool down and not be quite as bad. And I would be like, oh, all these comics are actually taking a lot of time and they're really hard and, you know, just sort of lose steam and, and you know, just forget about it for a while. And I sort of went through that cycle for, um, years like for probably 10 years i was going through a, a cycle like that and then um there's just a point where um you know if if you know anything about the video game industry there's like sort of constant rolling layoffs that happen and i sort of found myself with six months off six months off work you know and didn't have anything to do and i was just like at my wits end and i sort of put together uh, a portfolio all from scratch again. And um, and I was living in Southern California at the time. So I flew up to Portland um, to a comic book convention and uh, went to a portfolio review and, and showed my stuff to uh, James Lucas Jones, who was the editor at Oni Press at the time. And he was like, you know, I have a script on my desk that you might be really good for. So th that's basically how I got into doing the comics. But the, the main reason was just because I was so burnt out on, on video games. Cause you know, when I, when I was working on video games, I was mostly making sports games and I'm not really a sports guy, um, but I <laughs> worked on, you know, American football games and I worked on baseball games and, um, and like my, my job, my last job in video games was uh, working on the jumbotrons in uh a baseball game. And that was like my real only responsibility for the whole thing was these jumbotrons. And it was just sort of like, I felt like I wanted to do something with my life artistically that would be a little more rewarding than that, you know? And those, that was fun. That was a fun job. Like working on those jumbotrons was really fun and it was actually pretty easy. And, um, but it just ultimately wasn't, you know, what I wanted to do with my life. Fair Which enough. is, I'm, you know, I feel I'm, sometimes, sometimes I feel bad about that because I know that there's people who were would like, you know, cut off their arm to work in video games. But, um, you know, it's it's the same as working in in comics, though. It's like not um, at the end of the day, it is a job, 
you know, and, and it has its pros and cons. And, um, some days, some days the, you know, the, the cons outweigh the pros and sometimes the pros outweigh the cons. Um, but in general, the comics, um, it's been, it's been really good for me, much better than video games, I think. I'm glad to hear. And I'm, I'm really glad that you made the transition to uh, comic books because oh, nice. what you've brought to the medium <laughs> has been just magical. Everything that I've read of yours has been a real treat. So uh, thank oh, you nice. for making that decision and, and making the change. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a, a question that I really like to ask all creators that I interview. Uh, what does the comic book medium mean to you? I think the comic book medium is uh, like the greatest storytelling medium that exists. Like, I think it is um, like, I'd rather read a comic than watch a movie. I'd rather read a comic than watch TV. I'd rather read a comic than read a novel. You know, um, to me, it is like the, it packs an excitement, a visual excitement that um, no other medium can, can really um, compare. I think the like movies have a visual excitement, but it's always um, it's it's rarely actually like um, what you get in a comic book. Because what you get in a comic is like um, a, either like a single person or a small group of people's like singular vision of the story. And like when you're watching a movie, even with you know, an auteur director or whatever, there's, um, well, maybe not with an odd, like a real auteur guy, but like, you know, any movie that Hollywood produces is, um, you know, through the process of, you know, it's been processed through the machine to get to the end. And you, you lose that sort of singular vision that you can have with, with comics and like comics has the actual like hand of the maker on it you know, and that's something you can't really get, um, in, in any other medium, really. Um, and any other storytelling medium, like, I guess you could look at a painting and, and get that, but you can't get that out of, you know, a movie and even a novel, I guess a novel, you kind of have the hand of the maker in there, but it's not quite as direct as, as a drawing to me. So that's kind of rambly, but it's just like, it's the best storytelling medium. You know what I mean? It's like, you can tell any kind of story and you can tell it in, just these really strong, powerful, singular voices. And it's, um, there's something that I don't think you can really accomplish any other way. It's a, a beautiful answer. I, uh, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, I think we're all in this, you know, cause we, we love comic books, you know, the, the readers and, mm -hmm. and everything like that. And, uh, even this, us people on, on YouTube creating content around comic books and everything like that. Um, it's, it's given us all so much, you know what I mean, and it's uh, yeah, it's, it's great to hear uh, what creators, um, what comic books mean to creators. That's why I always love to get that question, and I appreciate you answering that one for me. All right, now we're going to get on to the writing game show. I've got uh, five questions for you okay. to have fun with. Uh, nothing serious. Uh, just yeah, try try to have as much fun with you um, with it as you can. The first question is a, a mainstay. I ask everyone this one. Uh, can you please write a sentence without using E or A in any of the words? Nope. No, I did. I used an E. No. <laughs> no. No. Terry Moore no. had the exact no, same period. answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm in, I'm in good company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a great answer too. Perfect. Um, Second question is, uh, Boom Studios approached you to write a comic book with Keanu Reeves, but the only idea he has is a guy <laughs> going berserk in a, in a field. Um, how would you stretch out that idea to get to 12 issues? Guy okay, going berserk in a field. Mm -hmm. I would probably have him go berserk in a field for like a thousand years. And do the story of the 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 communities and societies that grow up and fall around him. That's how I do it. Nice. Call me Keanu. We'll make it. We'll, <laughs> like make, it, we'll make it happen. <laughs> I haven't actually read Berserk. Is that like? What is that about? 
Uh, Have you read it? It goes like... up and down, to be honest. Uh, it started out really strong, I feel. Um, yeah, it's this guy that goes berserker, and uh, he's um, in the olden days, his uh, family or his dad or something cursed him with immortality, and uh, he's now he's in the current days, and uh, people are trying to, like the government or whatever, are trying to work out his immortality to... Oh to pass it on to other people and stuff. But it, it gets a, it gets really weird. Like I said, it started out really strong, first couple of issues, but it did fall off, unfortunately. Oh. And, um, well, I'm not surprised that, that it got weird because that's Matt Kent. That guy is king of going in strange and like un, unexpected directions and stuff. But that's what I was going to say too. I, I love Matt Kent. I've got a lot of Matt Kent books. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. Me too. Uh, yeah. He um couldn't save that one for me, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you please give a compelling backstory to a necklace found on the ground outside of a church? A necklace found on the ground outside of a church. Man, I'm not, I don't know if I'm this kind of a writer. Like I would say, <laughs> like, um, Like my 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 first thing is to say that it's somebody who lost their faith, and the necklace is not a necklace, but rather a rosary, and has chucked it on their way out the front door. I guess that's my answer. That's perfect. Right. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, this next question, we're going to go back to your video game days and uh, ask you what video game. What would uh, what sorry? Let me ask that again. What video game would you make if I could make any video game? Yeah, your own video. Like, game. If I, ooh, yeah. You know, I've always wanted like uh, I always wanted to work on sort of a post-apocalyptic video game. Doing um, and there've been a couple of good ones out there, but I wanted like I I always felt like there was room for like a. Uh, like a Minecraft style um, post-apocalyptic game where you could like build stuff. Nice. Yeah. Like a, a bit like Fallout, I suppose. Fallout, I've never Fallout. played Fallout. Can you do that? I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking more along the lines of like uh, uh, the new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where you build yeah, um, vehicles and stuff. Fallout 4 has some of those elements, but not like fully Minecraft. Like you can build houses and um, mm. things like that and little bases, but yeah, not quite like vehicles and everything else like that. But I could see, I could see that sounds like it would be a fun, a fun video game. Yeah. yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> this is the last question of the writing game show. Magpies are trying to run for, uh, for president. What's the story? Um, Oof, they're probably the best suited, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably, they're just the best ones for the job, so. You're getting it done. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. You, uh, Tyler, you, you nailed the writing game show. I can't uh, thank you enough. <laughs> nice. Um, if people want to uh, find you and follow you on uh, social medias and stuff like that, where can they find you to keep up with your works? Um, on just about everything, I am some version of Mr. Tyler Crook. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram and uh, Blue Sky right now. Um, and I'm on YouTube. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a, a live stream that I do every Friday night at 7 p.m. Pacific. You can hang out. Um, and that's sort of it. MrCrook.com. You can go there and sign up for my newsletter. Um, I just sent out my first one in a year um, a couple weeks ago. That um, I'm trying to do my newsletters as little comics too, so they're a lot more fun than just like a boring newsletter. So sign up for that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's it. I think that's everywhere I am. I, you know, I'm on Tumblr a little bit, and I'm on Mastodon a little bit. Um, but YouTube, Instagram, and Blue Sky are my, my main hangouts. Okay. Everyone uh, run out and go pick up the Lonesome Hunters. Support this book. Let's get it. Uh, four more volumes. That's what we're after. Yeah. Let's do it. 
Yeah, um, and library editions. Library editions. I, I've got the, all the Harry County library editions on my shelf over there. I absolutely love oh, those nice. books. Yeah, they, yeah they, they, they turned out beautiful. Yeah. Um, i got to ask you quickly as well. I see the guitar behind you there. Mm -hmm. How does uh, music help you or influence you in your um, comic process? Um, I think, actually, I think I think about um, comics writing a lot like music. Like, I don't really, I'm not an especially good, like, music player. Um, but actually, I guess there's, if you like Harrow County, there's a Harrow County soundtrack that I wrote. Um, that you can go stream on just about all the streaming platforms. Um, but I think of like, I approach storytelling in comics has a lot of sort of like mood and rhythm and sort of the tempo is important. And um, like, I think of characters a lot as sort of melodies or like their dialogue has like a melody where it sort of develops and, flows you through a scene. Um, so I think sort of conceptually, I think of them very, very similarly. Um, but yeah, I mean, like when you're, when you're making art, it's like making art is making art really. You're just learning different tools for, to try to get the same, same thing. So yeah, it's a big influence, but, um, but it's hard to really say like exactly what it is other than sort of like, that it has a lot of those same similarities about like timing and pacing and flow and, and mood and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, love, I love music as well. Music and comic books are, are tied for me. I play oh, yeah? a little bit myself and uh, yeah. I, thanks for letting me get that last question and appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> I, I, I can't thank you enough for your time as well. This last hour has, uh, has been a real treat getting to talk to you and um yeah, I'd love to love to have you back sometime to talk some more uh, when your next book comes out or whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate your time. Hey, my pleasure, man. Thank you so much for for helping get the word out about Lonesome Hunters. Awesome. I hope everyone goes and picks it up. And uh, thanks for watching.